You're focused on making important decisions to take your company to the next level. But who's counting? We are. Counting on trends and insight to move your business forward, operationally and strategically. Focused on helping executives achieve their highest potential. But Who's Counting is a podcast shedding light on and breaking down critical issues and opportunities for businesses. Brought to you by Anders CPAs and Advisors. Today, we're kicking off season three with a really interesting episode about grit, creativity, and following your values, featuring Michael Weiss, owner of Big Shark Bicycle Company and founder and owner of Big Shark Event Services. A Washington University grad, Michael started his bike business at 23 with nothing to lose and lucky timing going into the mountain bike boom of the 90s. My new co-host, Missy Kelly, and I learn all about the bike business and important lessons that translate across industries. When COVID kickstarted demand for certain products, Michael's business became the health club, vacation, and therapy for people amidst the pandemic and had to adapt to demand and inventory issues. Michael shares how his business is creating demand, building relationships, and inspiring future generations. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to season three of the But Who's Counting podcast. I'm Dave Hartley. Uh, In this season, I'm excited to welcome uh, a new co-host, Missy Kelly. So Missy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. I'm excited to be here. So uh, season three, we're going to specifically focus uh, the theme on uh, innovation in action. Uh, um, So we're going to talk with business owners and executives uh, across industries, sharing how they're embracing the latest trends in AI and leveraging innovative concepts and technologies to grow and future-proof their companies. So that will be the theme for season three. And uh, Missy, welcome to the show. Thank you. So today we are joined by Michael Weiss, owner of Big Shark Bicycle Company, which is a local independent bicycle dealer here in St. Louis, Missouri. Michael is also the founder and owner of the Big Shark Event Services, which operates, consults, and rents equipment for competitive recreational and charity events. Michael is a member manager at American Criterium Cup and a native St. Louisan. He attended Washington University in St. Louis. Welcome, Michael. It's good to see you. It's great to see you guys. So we're going to dig into the business of cycling and the innovative ways you've survived the ebb and flow of retail over the past 30 years with a pandemic sprinkled in. But let's start with you telling us how we got here. How did you choose this path and what kept you in it? You know, that's a uh, an interesting topic because when you go to uh, Washington University, you know, there's not really a program for independent retail. Um, so th- those are the sorts of the jobs you have along the way uh, while you're going through college. And uh, you don't look at them in the same regard as what your chosen degree might be. So I you know, wanted to learn more about cycling. I was an injured athlete in college and I worked at a local bike shop my senior year and realized pretty quickly that I had a the sort of personality for retail, which was not going to be really applicable in architecture, which was my degree. And I enjoyed the culture. That's good. So, uh, I mean, fast forward, uh, I never really thought of myself as entrepreneurial, but uh, I worked for a company that sort of was fraught with problems and they were, uh, you know, there's a life cycle to any business and they were at the end of theirs, you know, a very old, uh, an older proprietor and a, uh, family members that didn't want to continue his legacy. And so we saw an opportunity to uh, kind of pick up where they had left off. So you mentioned in, in school that they didn't have, you know, necessarily a program for retail. Did they have the entrepreneurial um, like launch programs that they have now? And were you part of that? You know, if they did, uh, I was not aware of them, you know, and, you know, the program at WashU that I was in was very much, you know, theory and design based, which I really enjoyed because it made you, th- you know, think creatively, solve problems without any limitations. And I think that actually applied itself to business more than I recognized. But there was nothing about, you know, this is how you uh, negotiate a lease or deal with the vendor. I mean, that was all unknown. So, Michael, it's great to meet you. So the, you know, when I think about that, 
taking the leap to become an entrepreneur is a pretty big leap. So I guess, did you have role models or kind of when you started, you know, we've got people that listen to the show that are startups, entrepreneurs, uh, wannabe entrepreneurs. So how did you make that decision? Did you have mentors, role models? Did you just have to fumble your way through for the first couple of years? Talk to us about that. Uh, I'll go with the fumble path. That was our strategy. I mean, we, uh, you know, I think about that because I started the business when I was 23. So very young. Um, you don't have fear when you're that young. Like the world, you can, you can make a mistake and recorrect. Um, and you had nothing to lose. So you haven't built equity. Uh, we're starting small, so there's not a big investment. So I think a lot of the things that would challenge somebody like who is going to do a career shift later uh, weren't problems for me. Uh, and we probably uh, optimism and naivete were, you know, a nice blend for us. And I think we got lucky. I mean, we opened the store when mountain bikes were booming. And so in the eighties, there weren't mountain bikes in the early nineties, there were, and it was propelling the bike industry. So uh, definitely not intentional, but we did time it pretty well. So, Tell us about the cycling industry and how, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, there were not really online retailers, right? So this is like, when did that kind of come into play for you? And how did that affect your path? You know, prior to online retailers, there was always mail order, right? I mean, so that was something we all were aware of, you know, national brands that were in categories for retail. And uh, those were, you know, I think what was the predecessor to the the direct to consumer model we have today. And so, you know, we, we still complained about it. We just complained differently. Uh, but, you know, cycling or while we've been in business, uh, there's been a technologic revolution. Uh, there's been a proliferation of types of cycling and a lot of technologies have become integrated into the product. And so we've seen 30 years of really dynamic change. And then obviously, like you mentioned, the distribution model has, uh, you know, I hate the word omnichannel, <laughs> but, you know, it's really, there's a path to market. And I don't think people really care anymore how things arrive. What about the big box retailers? You know, I think they're challenged too, because they have to, they have to be all things to all people. You know, they have to provide that in-store experience, but they also have to be extremely good at fulfillment. Uh, and what they lack is uh, the ability to really attract, you know, great personnel and have uh, and be specialists. You know, so I think big box in our industry is very good for beginners and recreation, but not great when it comes to, uh, you know, a few steps up that ladder. So, Michael, I want to spend some time talking about the pandemic, because one of the things that, you know, I think everybody's heard the story during the pandemic, everything got locked down. So suddenly everybody wants a bicycle and you and you can't get one uh, because they're they're sold out everywhere and supply chain issues and those types of things. So in my mind, it seems like there was this huge rush that probably pulled forward demand by a couple of years. And then now I imagine things are settling back out again. So talk to us about that in terms of, you know, uh, for a business owner that's dealing with challenges and things like that. Talk to us about your response to the pandemic, sort of what happened um, and, and sort of how your how your business has survived and thrived through that. Well, you know, I think that um, everybody remembers like the like the uh, dislocation that happened in those first few weeks of March in 2020 and the products that they needed to get immediately. You know, everybody wanted hand sanitizer. Everybody wanted PPE, masks, you know. Uh, toilet paper. And toilet paper, right? I mean, those were suddenly, you know, who knew that these things were going to be, uh, you know, gold, right? It's like the oil rush. Uh, and we were next in line. And so when those sorts of demand surges happened for those other types of products that were, you know, kind of, uh, you know, to directly related to the surge in, in COVID response, bikes were next. And so if you look at the, you know, like the, uh, what the graph of that demand might look like in those, 
those types of commodities, we became very much a commodity and we were, we were on a parallel path. So we had to adjust at the same pace as demand. And I think the majority of people in uh, outdoor retail or specialty retail had a wait and see approach and their wait and see approach was maybe 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. And uh, it became apparent to us really quickly that this was going to be, uh, this is going to go on for a year or more. Um, and it, as it became, you know, a really turbulent press cycle and, you know, culture shift and uh, a dislocation for everybody's activities, doing everything anytime, uh, that's where cycling became the health club and it became the vacation and it became uh, your therapy. You know, so we really became a lot of things to a lot of people. So how long did it take for you to see that dynamic take place? You mentioned 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Like, was there a day when it happened? And then from that point on, it was just like unlimited demand for some period of time? You know, everything is sort of uh, in our industry, it, it's seasonal, right? So if the pandemic is occurring, as spring is occurring, we're already in this acceleration, uh, at least at our latitude in Missouri. So we were already gearing up. And so we know what our numbers are. We go from literally, you know, dormant to awake to alive. And we were just about to hit seasonal, seasonal surging and buying. And so we were already anticipating uh, dramatic growth. Uh, going from off to on. Um, so we know our numbers. Like we knew like at one of our locations in a week, we might sell 20 bikes. And the next week we'd expect 50. And the next week we can expect 75. And it'll stabilize at sort of what is our scale in this market. Uh, and so we pretty quickly saw, you know, a normal week when it should have been abnormal. You know, we don't know if we could stay open. We don't know if we're essential. And suddenly we're as busy as we ever were. So we're not even allowing customers in our store. We're trying to be, you know, as responsible as we felt we, we should be or needed to be. And uh, in two weeks, we were doing five times or six times the business that we typically do. And so we just did the math on that. We said, okay, if we're five times busier then everyone's five times busier, and we knew that the current inventory levels in the United States, were not gonna be able to sustain that. And so that's when we, you know, re, I'd say reactively or actively uh, went into a completely different strategy than we've ever, uh, you know, ever had to use. And did you see that across like with your competition or were there others that maybe reacted differently and, and weren't as successful? I, I think we were probably uh, more, more responsive than others in this market and certainly you know there's other other folks that have cycling enterprises around the country that also had you know the relationships in place and had the conversations in place with people that were seeing trends at a higher altitude um, a lot of our vendors we have visibility uh, i mean the tools and the instrumentation are so good for so we can manage just-in-time delivery we can look at uh if we see models going out and even if a model goes out sometimes they then would put tell you when that next projected date would be when are they going to fulfill and so you know we not only placed you know immediate orders everyone did but then we placed in back orders and you had to be in line uh, and so it got to the point with us where we had you know a year or two years of product on order and we realized that if there were going to be delays, that wasn't going to be fast enough. And so we then began to say, well, okay, you know, we're doing everything the way we're the, through the proper channels. Are there other ways to get bikes uh, out of Asia? And so that was something we pivoted to where we started going outside of the uh, B2B sites and outside of the sales reps and going directly to folks that could help us uh, with manufacturing. So you had to pivot pretty quickly. And if you're thinking about like talking to some of the younger entrepreneurs or people just starting out, 
what from the pandemic would you say is something that is useful to someone who is starting a business or maybe even hitting one of those um, ebb and flow cycles that's difficult when you're first starting up? You know, I would say actually having an understanding of the business you're in is usually not, you know, we all have a sense of how it works. Uh, you know, we, you know, you probably don't know where your appliance came from, right? You know, you don't know how many component pieces are in that appliance, country of origin, what port it came through. So we, we got a crash course in ver like the vertical nature of our industry. And I think that's important for anybody in a business to know is, you know, you should know. And uh, for 28 years or 27 years, we didn't. And then the other is um, being a little instinctual and being, uh, you know, being able to process what you're seeing, you know, and I think that could be true for success or failure. Uh, but we, we saw uh, an opportunity and, we felt like we couldn't make mistakes uh, because the opportunity was so great. And we were right until, you know, vaccine efficacy and the unknown of what post pandemic was going to yield. So at what point, um, this is kind of going back a little bit, but at what point did you start the other like kind of revenue streams or um, like the event business, which is, another revenue stream for you. Was that from the very beginning um, or is that something that you added as you went along? Because it, it seems you know, like I, you've been creative I mean, along the way that that you, you in the pandemic, you went direct, you know, so you innovated in that way. Seems like the event business is also another way that you've innovated. So, so share with us about that. Well, I, I think that there's sort of some things that we all know on an unconscious level about activities. Like we all make assumptions that there's always going to be little league baseball or there's going to be a 5K on the weekend or there's going to be camps, you know. And so in the cycling industry, when I first got into it, I just assumed that there were people in our market that created programming. And I also thought there were going to be people in our market. And by market, I mean the St. Louis area or the Midwest that had a vision for, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's be, think about what, you know, what is here. And then let's also think about what's not here. And uh, the first few years we were open, we, we just assumed that we were a bicycle store that was supporting a demand that was already present. We didn't think about creating demand, mm -hmm. uh, but I was an athlete and I enjoyed going to events and, and competing. And what I realized was that all of those people that I sort of took for granted uh, were getting older, you know, just sort of the, the you know, the coincidence of this, of the specific scenarios here. And as people, you know, would phase out of uh, being engaged in the cycling community, be it recreation or charity or competition or triathlon, whatever, or, or even advocacy that created uh, like an, an ever thinning calendar of events in St. Louis. And so our first taste was uh, carrying the torch of for some people that came before us and trying to understand and learn from them what they did, why they did it, and just try to main, maintain an equilibrium. Like we weren't adding to the, uh, the calendar or the ecosystem. We were just, trying to be a torchbearer for it. And that was kind of where we cut our teeth uh, outside of the walls of our store. Um, a little self-serving because I wanted things to do. So, you know, <laughs> let's uh, get involved. So when did you realize the revenue opportunity that was there? Like, did you start, did you start doing a bunch of events right out of the gate? Did it take time? Did you just, is this a gradual business that grew over the course of years or how did things evolve and mature? Well, you know, probably the, you know, right. There's a lot of people that are in profession, professional event management development, and they are putting money as one of their pillars. And I never did that. Like I, I, I initially simply, you know, the motivation was to make sure that there's continuity and there's a calendar. And so, as we began to do these things, that was kind of the revelation was, oh, people are paying. You can, 
not just break even, uh, you can make money. And so over time, what we've realized is sometimes making money is breaking even. Like there has to be, you know, if you're just doing things at a, you know, a zero revenue, uh, you know, model, you're not paying, you're not valuing yourself. You're not, you're not investing in the future of growing a business or growing the market. So in order to maintain, but also to improve, we had to build kind of event p &Ls, which could carry over money into the next year. Uh, there's two kind of two ways to do it. You can, you can have a lot of events that make a little, or you can have a few events that make a lot. And we, uh, we definitely spent several years having a lot of events that made nothing. <laughs> and so we tried to, you know, just tune those models and all those micro events. And that put us in position where we could begin to look at some, you know, large, larger prospects and trying to have a different view of uh, St. Louis or the region. Because then we began to say, okay, well, what's in Europe? What's on the coasts? Uh, we're in flyover country. You know, we don't want to be perceived as being, uh, you know, state number 25 or 30 out of 50. We want to be a, um, you know, have a better, more confidence about what we do here. And uh, yeah, and so that's been kind of the path we got on. And some of those events are not cycling, correct? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, when you're organizing an event, I mean, it could be a bake sale, it could be a gala, it could be a bike race. They all have the same, uh, you know, sort of planning documents. They all have the same phases. And um, certainly we have subject matter expertise in some areas, but, you know, uh, the seasonality of St. Louis means that you're not always going to be riding your bike or swimming. You know, that's, we wanted to expand the calendar to a 12 month four season calendar and look at uh, activities that people could do. So we have more outdoor culture here, not just cycling culture. Uh, and then what began to happen is we get in, we began to get calls. And so a great example would be the Edward Jones company. Uh, they wanted to do a, um, an internal to their company uh, fundraising effort uh, over uh, one of their regions, which is the, the, the US for them is in, in probably five regions, but they wanted to create a cycling program that followed the path of the Oregon Trail and the Santa Fe Trail and the original telegram. So that's not a local bike race, right. but you know, we sat down with them and said, okay, well, how many markets, how many days, how many people, and then we just began to take what we, you know, our kind of template and adjust it for a, a much more aspirational event. Wow. And then of course, then we're like, well, what do you charge Edward Jones? You know, they're. <laughs> sure. Not really a template for that from shifting no. to yeah a 5k or a, um, you know, a short race on the weekend to that. How long, how long, like, is that like a, a week long thing or is that, um, does it go beyond that? Uh, we did, we did uh, several iterations of that for them. They called it the tour de Ted. And it was, you know, basically there, I knowing nothing about financial institutions. I, uh, they were the hometown, you know, big hitter and sure. their model. I didn't understand that they're a small office, you know, embedded in all these communities. And they basically said that the two things that affect their clientele the most are cancer and Alzheimer's. At the end of your life, whatever your portfolio is, you you can make bad decisions or good decisions, but health decisions are the ones that really erode your family's stability and your portfolio. And so they felt like that if they tried to do things in those areas, they were actually giving back to their clients. And I believed it. I don't think that was a, uh, so I thought that was a nice alignment of principle and business. Um, the events, the first event they want to do is a two week event uh, where they're in every market that had a, a financial institution along the path of the first telegram. So uh, that was two weeks. Later on, they did an Alzheimer's event that was 130 days where they wanted to walk from the two oldest cities in the US back to St. Louis to their headquarters. 
And so uh, that was for the Alzheimer's Association. And they, you know, over all the events, they probably raised three or four million dollars. And uh, we'd help them do it. We're proud of it. Um, but yeah, nobody, they, they didn't do that for ex like accolades. They did it f for their uh, their culture. And so, uh, you know, who, who knew that that would be something we would do? And uh, yeah, now and we still do that for other charities. And doing like in different states and that you're dealing with different municipalities and different you know, local governments and that um, those are all things that take some experience and I'm sure are different in different areas as well. Yeah, I mean, my first taste at a national footprint event was when Governor Nixon was looking at some like international cycling events that were in California and Georgia. And so he wanted to sort of explore how these states could attract Tour de France level events. And so he found my name because that's what we were doing in Missouri was just, we were like probably the only name he could have called. And I went to the governor's office and they basically said, yeah, we want to do this. And so, uh, you know, for three years, 2006 through 2009, Missouri had a uh, international professional event, sort of like a, a premier league soccer event uh, that went around the state and did quite well. Um, my exposure to that was rather than trying to do something I was not qualified to do. I, I just called the best event. There's only one company in the United States that does international events like that. So I just called them and I said, there's an opportunity here for you. I can't do this. You can, uh, but I think we have the resources to, to uh, partner with you. And so they said, that's great. We're going to need to hire someone. How about you? And so uh, I took a job for three or four years working while I had my business uh, working at that event. And it was like a, for a great networking. I learned a lot. And now I apply that pretty much to everything we touch. So we're visiting today with Michael Weiss, the owner of Big Shark Bicycle Company. Uh, Michael, one of the things I want to talk about is um, your involvement in uh, both the film and, I guess, criteria, Criterium, the American Criterium Cup. Is that correct? Yeah, that is. Uh, that's our French word of the day. <laughs> okay. So, so how did you, it, you, you've mentioned you sort of have been involved in this, you know, journey with cycling. So I guess, when did that come to be? What is it? Because I don't think probably the vast majority of our audience really understands it, knows what it is. And then I guess there's a film that's debuting this spring that kind of highlights this sport. So can you educate us on what that is and, and how it works and what the appeal of it is? Yeah. You know, I'll say there's like, there's this polarity in, in how people look at cycling as a sport. Like I always say, I don't want to be a toy store. You know, we could be transit or we could be sport uh, we, or we could be just health. Right. Those are good topics. Uh, makes it seem more real. So as the sport would go, uh, biggest sporting event in the world is the Tour de France. You know, it's bigger than Super Bowl. Uh, the uh, the stage for that has always been Europe. Uh, but we all are familiar with Greg LeMond and Lance Armstrong and those stories. And so the question is, you know, how did guys from the States get there. And, you know, the answer hopefully isn't drugs, but it's, you know, <laughs> there's it's drugs and they had to race the United States. <laughs> right. uh, what we realized is uh, America is, you know, much, much larger than Europe. You know, you can have uh, these giant sporting events that showcase a country, Tour de France, Tour of Spain, Tour of Italy, but you can't, America's too big to have Tour of America. Um, our cities are constructed differently. We're on grids, wider streets, Europe, tiny streets, ancient streets, even the city centers are, uh, you know, you can't, you can't have a super truck in, you know, in Paris, right? I mean, you need something tiny. And so all of the, uh, the architecture of the sport is different in the United States and the sports fan is also different in the United States. And so the type of racing that the U S is very, very, very good at is the sort of shorter course, very explosive, very aggressive, sort of short form of bike racing. And that's uh, 
you know, that is our, uh, that is our sweet spot here in the U S and then what happens is rather than, you know, you'll have a million people on a mountain in the middle of Europe. Here we have a million people in our urban centers. And so it's a way to bring the best type of cyclists, the best type of uh, best highest quality event to, uh, a market in the US. And so that's what the American Crit Cup is. It's the 10 biggest races in the United States. And rather than wait for our governing body, which is part of the Olympic movement to sort of professionalize it, uh, all of us kind of got together to look out for our uh, ourselves and the sport and sort of said, we should take a leadership role in, in cultivating the sport. So uh, here we are, you know, we have one of the top 10 races in the country in St. Louis, uh, and it's still not, I don't feel we've broken through the consciousness of the sports fan in St. Louis to understand that, uh, it's a, it is a opportunity to, uh, kind of galvanize community around, uh, one of the biggest events that we could attract. So how did the film come to be? Well, it, it's funny because uh, you know, cycling does not involve a ball, you know, so we, <laughs> we, we're that's your first up. challenge. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, there's this sort of there right now in sport, there's sort of two paths to, uh, I, I think a bigger audience and with that bigger audience comes acceptance or sponsorship or, you know, return. Um, one is if you're on a major network. And if you're not on a major network, then the question is always like, well, where are you going to be? And, you know, and then it's then there's like all the layers of digital content. And so uh, in the first year of the American Criterium Cup, uh, there was a, a world championship event that was supposed to come to the United States and it uh, did not. It got, went to Italy and uh, a, a local outside media group had all this money that they were going to put into that and streaming it and video, like video, video work. And uh, they diverted that money to us. And so we spent about a half million dollars in 2022 screening every race, three to four hours of live footage on the weekend. Here's the best racers in the U S and what we found was that uh, there's not a live audience, a remote live audience for it. So we could have spent $2 million and our numbers would have been, uh, to probably would have been disappointing. And so we felt like just watching the action live didn't connect people to the athlete, didn't tell like, who are they? Where are they from? Why are they doing this? What are they doing? Like just a fixed camera angle, watching, you know, people go through a corner in a blur is not the best way to capture what's happening. You need on in drones and you need onboard cameras and you need uh, a narrative. And so we hired a filmmaker to celebrate what's actually happening there. Cause the, the seeing one of these events live is that's the secret sauce. Like that's what people who show up fall in love with the sport and they have a great day in on their hometown. We wanted to come up with a digital product that uh, not only delivered that same emotion, but kind of uh, multiplied it. And so that's the film. It's uh, called We Are Rock and Roll. And it's uh, we, we, we found a filmmaker who made some pieces we, uh, we really inspired us. So we just cold called him. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he took on the, the job. So what's the significance of the name? The, the We Are Rock and Roll, how does that connect? What What's the impact of that? Uh, well, if you come see the film, uh, <laughs> one, of the first, one of the first quotes uh, is from one of our announcers, and he talks about his his uh, affection and excitement around the sport. And he goes, if you call European bike racing, if that's a symphony, come to America and we'll show you what rock and roll is. Oh, I love it. That's very cool. So when is so, that, yeah, that when is that released? Uh well, it's uh I don't know when this uh podcast airs, but it's gonna be uh, at the High Point Theater on February fifteenth this year. Okay, so and we'll then after that date, yeah, will it will it be on streaming? Will it be in other theaters or 
We're, uh, we're, it's going to be at the High Point Theater. We're doing local shows first in each host city. So they get the opportunity to create a, a private showing. And then on February 25th, it'll be on the American Crypt Cup YouTube channel and uh, just available for free. No paywall. Just enjoy it. Well, that sounds great. Great way to align your passions with uh, connecting and building your community. So uh, so we've been visiting today with Michael Weiss, uh, the owner of Big Shark Bicycle Company. So, Michael, one of the things that we do at every at the end of every episode is we do the make it count segment. And that's where we we share one actionable takeaway that business leaders listening to this can can count on and take away with them. So as it relates to innovation, what are the things that you would say, you know, the actionable insight that you could share to our listeners for them to take action on? You know, I one of the things I've learned is you're not entitled. And so I feel like for our business to be successful, I have to figure out what is going to give the most value to my customers. And it's not going to be uh you know, here's a great bike at a great price, or we know how to, you know, we can repair something. It's going to be what's the experience you want to have. And if you focus on something that's a little bit more uh, important, like uh, the experience, like I had a guy once say to me, you know, you go to a hardware store and you want to buy a drill, but that's not really what you want. You want a hole. And when I, I look at what I'm doing, I think I am creating, uh, demand. I'm, I'm building relationships. I am inspiring a young kid to maybe do this later in life, which might turn into a car free life. Um, so I, I, I like to think about all the downstream impacts of what we do. Great. Well, Michael, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you taking the time to share your insights with uh, our audience. Yes. I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you. It's flattering. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining the But Who's Counting podcast. Make sure to never miss an episode by subscribing on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And let us know what you think by rating and reviewing. Keep up with more Anders CPAs and Advisors insights by following us on social media through the handles in the show notes. We'll see you next time.